All right. Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Rachel. I work in community engagement at the State Museum. I still see quite a few people joining us, but as we get started, um, just make sure you're muted. If you bring your mouse down kind of the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little microphone icon with a line through it that should be red. And that means that you're muted and we won't have any interference with our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, either for our speaker or about your audio or anything like that, feel free to use the chat feature. If you go down to the bottom of your screen again, the same little panel, you'll see a chat bubble. Click on that and just make sure you choose from a drop down menu all panelists so we can see questions. Um, and again, that can be a tech question or it could be a question for our speaker. Um, at the end, we will have a few minutes for Q&A. So if you have anything you really want to know, please uh, submit that at any time. Um, and if you need any help, we have Joyska Nunez-Mazina on here as well. Um, you can see her listed as a panelist. She'll be helping with our Q&A at the end, and she's here um, to help with any of those questions. But to get right into it, I will introduce our speaker. And before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and get our PowerPoint up. Uh, but our speaker today is Linda Wynn, who is so well known here in Nashville. She is um, a longtime friend of the State Museum. She has worked with the State Museum, with the First Museum, with the Nashville Library Foundation as a consultant. Uh, she's the Assistant Director of Programs for the Tennessee Historical Commission. She works in the Department of History at Fisk University, teaching history and public administration. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here and to speak on the subject of African-American women and the vote, uh, more specifically the 19th Amendment. And as we all know that that was a long road uh, to the summer of 1920. Uh, in the summer of 1920, the state of Tennessee captured the attention of the nation as those who favored women getting the right to vote, who were known as the suffragists, and those who opposed women gaining the right of the franchise anti suffragists descended upon the volunteer state to campaign for their respective positions. As the Tennessee General Assembly was poised, to consider ratifying the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, giving women the right to participatory democracy by granting them the right to vote. On May 21st, 1919, the amendment cleared the U.S. House of Representatives with 42 votes to spare. The Senate vote, which came on June the 4th, 1919, was 56 to 25, with most Democrats voting no, Southern Democrats voting no. 35 of the 36 states needed had ratified the amendment. Eight states rejected the amendment. Five states took no action. And so you had eight states rejected the amendment and five states had taken no action most. Southern states rejected the women's suffrage amendment uh, because of racial a racialist calculation that the entitlement would include African American women. Anti suffragists used the same reasoning in Tennessee. Notwithstanding, suffragists considered Tennessee as their last and best hope for ratification before the presidential election of 1920. If Tennessee ratified the amendment, approximately 27 million women would be eligible to cast the ballot in the next presidential election. Given women political power over 130 years after the founding of America. Governor A.H. Roberts called a special session of the General Assembly on August the 9th, 1920, to consider the issue of women and the vote. Pro-suffrage and anti-suffrage supporters from across the state and the country descended upon Nashville, determined to bring 
and influence the state legislature to their respective positions. However, the road to the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution began long before its ratification. It was the culmination of almost a century of activism, agitation, and protest for women's suffrage. The right to vote had been an issue at variance with America's founding principles since its beginning, when those who penned the lofty document wrote, we the people. Signed by 39 of the 59 delegates on September the 7th, 1787, it basically excluded, or it did exclude African-Americans, apart from references to enslavement and women. It is impossible to commemorate the centennial of women's suffrage without looking at the sesquicentennial of the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which was ratified on February the 3rd, 1870, giving African-American men the vote. And you also have to look at how the passage of that amendment impact, impacted both pro and anti-suffragists. It's important to emphasize that from the beginning, African-Americans, both women and men were involved in the almost 20th century struggle to gain the right of the franchise for women. African-American women, both from the state of Tennessee and Nashville were involved in the civil rights struggle for women's rights to access the ballot box. During the 19th century, African-Americans and white women organized around the abolition movement in the 1830s. Bostonian Maria, Mariah Stewart, a pioneering African-American activist and the first woman to speak before a mixed gendered audience spoke out for both the rights of African-Americans and women. Later on July, from July 19th to July 20th, 1948, in New York's small town of Seneca Falls at the first women's rights convention in the United States, Elizabeth Cadden Staten waged her discontent by rewording the most famous phrasing in the American political creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. She further proposed a resolution that called for women's right of the franchise. Only a few men and the only African-American to attend Seneca Falls was universal suffragist Frederick Douglass. Douglass supported Stanton and her call giving women the right to vote. He argued that the ballot was the guarantee of all other rights the key to liberty and women must be bold. Formerly enslaved, Douglas described himself as a women's rights man. He knew firsthand the injustices superimposed upon the enslaved and understood that women like African-Americans enslaved and free were all constrained by American law and custom. Douglas, publisher of the North Star, penned an editorial articulating his unequivocal backing of women's rights. In respect to political rights, we hold women to be justly entitled to all we claim for men. If government it only is just, which governs by the free consent of the governed, there can be no reason in the world for denying to women the exercise of the elected franchise or a hand in making and administrating the law of the land. Douglas remained committed to gaining women gaining the right to vote throughout his life. Even when consternation began to stir with the pending passage of the 15th Amendment that gave African-American men the vote. Later in 1866, Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, he co-founded the American Equal Rights Association. 
Three years after Senator Falls Convention on May 29, 1851, Sojourner Truth, formerly known just as Isabella or Isabella Bumphrey, she was an abolitionist and, inform and formerly enslaved Black woman, addressed the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Most notably, her address has been referred to as Ain't I a Woman. However, this speech was published in 1863. That's 12 years after Truth gave the Ain't I a Woman speech by a white abolitionist named Frances Barker Gage. She not only changed Truth's words, but represented her speaking in a stereotypical Southern Black slave accent rather than Truth's distinctive Upper New York Low Dutch accent. However, the most authentic version of Sojourner's Truth Ain't I a Woman's Speech was first published in 1851 by Truth's good friend, the Reverend Marius Robinson in the Anti-Slavery Bugle and was entitled On Women's Rights. Now, credit for unearthing Robinson's 1851 version of true speech must be given to historian Dr. Neil Irvin Painter, a former professor at Princeton University and author of Sojourner Truth, A Life A Symbol. From the early 1850s to 1858, other African-American women attended women's rights conventions, including Margarita Forden, and Harriet Fortin Purvis and Sarah Parker Redmond, who attended the 1858 National Rights Convention. No African American women, women participated in the 1859 or the 1860 conventions. Now, the American Civil War disrupted the women's suffrage movement as many continued to champion the abolition of enslavement. Once the war ended, and the talk of the 14th and 15th Amendments increased, many women hoped to gain the same rights of citizenship that would be granted to those previously enslaved. Prior to the proposed amendment, only white men had the right to vote. The 14th Amendment, Section 2, added is the first mention of gender in the United States Constitution. And that section stipulated that all male citizens over 21 years of age should have access to the ballot. Simply stated, the 14th Amendment defined citizens and voters exclusively as male. The committee that drafted the amendment and inserted the word male betrayed the phallus of women who had worked for abolition of the enslaved and African-American civil rights. Elizabeth Cannon Staten cautioned that if male was inserted into the amendment, it would take almost a century to have it nullified. Later, the Congress passed the 15th Amendment which was ratified February the 3rd, 1870. It gave African-American men the right to vote and caused consternation among women who had fought for the right of the franchise. Through the 19th century, the woman question was at the core of movements against enslavement and for civil rights. As American approached the progressive era beginning in the 1890s, the women's question again entered the political arena. By the end of the second decade of the 20th century, Nashville, the state of Tennessee, and women's suffrage captured the center stage. Almost from the beginning, women's suffrage was entangled with the issue of race, and this entanglement played out in Nashville. 55 years after the Civil War's last battle. Despite racism being front and center in Nashville among both the suffragists and the anti-suffragists, 
African American women were among those who favored women having the right to vote. Now, unlike white women activists, often who created their own institutions separate from men, African American women often organized within already existing institutions, such as churches, political organizations, mutual aid societies, and schools. The first convention of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896, held its first convention in Nashville in 1897. As president of the NACW, Mary Church Carroll, a native Tennessean, campaigned tirelessly among black organizations and mainstream white organizations, writing and speaking extensively. She actively embraced women's right of the franchise or women's suffrage, which she deemed essential to elevating the status of African-American women and consequently the entire race. She actively campaigned for black women's suffrage. She even picketed the Wilson White House with members of the National Women's Party in her zeal for women's suffrage. Terrell fought for women's suffrage and civil rights because she realized that she belonged to the only group in this country that has two such huge obstacles to surmount, both sex and race. Nettie Langster Napier was also, who was also treasurer of the National Organization of Colored Women, uh, served as treasurer of the National Organization. Other women included women like Minnie Lou Crossway, who was registrar at Fisk University, Drs. Josie Wells and Maddie E. Coleman, practicing physicians, Juno Frankie Pierce, and Mrs. G. L. Jackson or Hattie S. Smith Jackson who were founders of women's clubs. Mrs. Henry Allen Board, who was a Georgia Bradford Board. These women not only enjoyed local support, but through such organizations as the NACW and with communities in Tuskegee, Atlanta, and Washington, DC. Perhaps the most notable of these women in the struggle for women's suffrage is J. Frankie Pierce and Dr. Maddie Coleman, a founder of the National Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. She also served as president of the Negro Women's Reconstruction League. Like Coleman, she served on the management committee for the Blue Triangle branch of the Young Women's Christian Association. By 1919, as people in Tennessee worked for or against becoming the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, the suffrage movement was mostly segregated, especially in the Jim Crow South. Notwithstanding, during a meeting of the white women in Nashville, which Coleman was asked to attend, she offered support for the reforms of white activists and reminded them that 12,000 Negro women of the state are organized and seeking a vocational school for girls. Pierce and Coleman made the girls vocational part of the program of the Tennessee women's suffrage. African American women's clubs worked with white women's clubs on several social issues, and these connections promoted an association in Nashville on women's suffrage. African American women worked with white suffrage organizations to get out the vote in the 1919 municipal election. During that year, they helped to get 2,500 African American women to vote in the city's first election, in which Black women were eligible to vote. The chair of the Tennessee Equal Suffrage League, Catherine Kenney, was awed at 
Pierce's organizational skills and invited her to address the first convention of the Tennessee League of Women's Voters in the state's capital lower chamber in May of 1920. What will the Negro women do with the vote? The daughter of a free father and an formerly enslaved mother asked her audience. We will stand by white women. We are asking only one thing, a square deal. We want recognition in all forms of this government. We want a state vocational school and a child welfare department of the state and more room in state schools. The league adopted the school as a part of its legislative agenda and lobbied extensively for its passage and realization. Through their actions, African-American women echoed Anna Julia Cooper's declaration, when and where I enter, then and there the whole Negro race enters with me. After the resolution passed the Tennessee State Senate, both suffragists and anti-suffragists desperately lobbied to secure votes in the House of Representatives where the vote was close. Representative Harry T. Byrne of Maoda changed his vote in support of ratification, thereby breaking a tie in the House of Representatives and subsequently history. The Tennessee General Assembly passed the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution on August the 18th, 1920. Opponents worked to rescind the ratification vote on constitutional technicalities. Some anti-suffrage legislators even fled the state in an attempt to prevent a quorum in the Tennessee General Assembly. Their efforts failed. On, their efforts failed. On August the 20th, Governor Albert H. Roberts certified Tennessee's ratification of the 19th Amendment. Two days later, U.S. Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby issued a proclamation that officially declared the ratification of the 19th Amendment and made it a part of the United States Constitution. Tennessee provided the 36th and final state needed to ratify the amendment to the Constitution that gave women the right of the franchise. The passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment did not guarantee African-American women the right of the franchise as racial segregation and Jim Crow laws prevented many African-American women from voting. It would take the civil rights crusades of the 1960s fought in the streets before African-American realized full suffrage through the Voting Rights Thank you. I'm just going to close down the presentation from Joyce there. Just going to get ready for some questions. All right, we're going to start. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to say if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in now. Um, but that was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have, it's amazing how little of this scholarship is available online when doing research for uh, the women's suffrage movement. And uh, do you know how you, came across that, how you went about that research? Basically, uh, I guess being a history professor, I tend to meld in women's suffrage with my class, uh, Women in the Civil Rights Movement, because I see women's suffrage as a part of that movement. And while that class focuses primarily on African-Americans, I do bring in um, white women who were involved in both. Uh, 
really it comes from basically you know, doing a lot of research uh, and having access to uh, some of the archives of this university and also reading many of the secondary sources. Uh, as I mentioned in my paper that when you are want to know something about the general truth, obviously one of the first books I can sub is you know, Painter's book. Uh, we had unearthed what the original speech was. I mean, even, you know, even as a student of history myself, uh, a number of years back when I was reading Me and I, a Woman, I kept thinking truth was a duck, much to say. So, you know, why is this written in this particular type of demand? Uh, because it would not have been accurate. So I always kind of had that little thought in the back of my head. Um, and I, you know, I kept looking for someone to unearth it and nail paint it in. Um, again, you know, you can, as I tell my students, research can be very painstaking, but it can also be very rewarding. Uh, I enjoy uh, sitting in the archives when I have an opportunity to go just looking for things and, and, and finding information. And sometimes I have a propensity for saying, okay, I found what I know, what I wanted to know. Uh, and I can be satisfied with that. But then I also go back and remember, it does want no good if you find it and you don't share it with others. And that is one of the purposes of, of history, is to share that narrative, to, you know, to come up with new thesis. Uh, you may have thesis that said one thing 30 years ago, but it, you know, the literature will dictate that it may change based on uh, primary documents that you may have found. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, oftentimes it does require that deeper research and hopefully um, a lot more of the scholarship is um, made more available and shared with the general public. Um, but uh, we have another question uh, that comes in that's asking, we know a lot about um, white men's opinion of uh, women having the right to vote. Do we have any uh, knowledge of the opinion of African-American men and women getting the right to vote? Uh, most, obviously there was some opposition among African-American men, but many uh, understood that intersection of, of race and, and gender. Uh, and as many of the women, as many women of the period were, were stating, it was understood that if women gained the right to vote, it would also help and assist the race as a whole. Uh, you know, I have read, you know, some where there was opposition, but uh, the black women who were involved in the struggle were uh, very vociferous uh, in in asking, you know, why. Uh, and I think Mary Church Terrell made the statement about no good colored man would be against women having the right to vote. Uh, so, you know, interracially, uh, there was discussion among men and women. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, men were were for women gaining the right to vote. Um, so a question that I have is um, what, after the 19th Amendment passes and then we see this kind of um, resistance to African-American women voting uh, through polling taxes and other forms, um, what were the roles of women clubs, um, African-American women clubs after this? in trying to push for African-American getting the right, women getting the right to vote, or even just generally speaking, uh, did they have a role there? Um, they did, you know, and I think it depends on really what section of the country that you may be speaking of. I, you know, if you look at Nashville, for example, in the 1950s, African-American women and African-Americans were voting. Uh, even if you go back before that, you have African-Americans who are serving on the National City Council 
uh, which means that they were in those districts that were primarily African American, and they voted. So it, it sort of de depends, but generally speaking, when you look at the South in totality, uh, you will find that those Jim Crow laws are being were put into place, have been put into place, and uh, you know you mentioned the poll tax, but you can also mention the literacy test. Uh, some of the literacy tests could be as ridiculous as counting the number of marbles in the jar, or you know it could be as ridiculous as saying that certain individuals, black individuals, had not passed the test because it was at the discretion of those who gave the test. And in many instances, those who were administering the test did not have the same degree of education as some of the Blacks who were trying to gain the right of the franchise. Uh, so, you know, it depends, but it would take that uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act, which has today, in my opinion, been basically decimated uh, when you take out the main portion of the act. Uh, so we're back at that same struggle. Uh, today we're talking about voter suppression. Uh, voter suppression is what's coming in because those states that were under uh, Section 5 of the uh, 65 Voting Rights Act are no longer under uh, review. And so when they do things like saying photo IDs or you can be a college student and Nashville at a state school even uh, and be issued I need, but that's not good enough. Uh, yeah, you can use other forms of ID. Uh, and, you know, and especially if you have state schools, that's a state school, so to me that's a state ID. Uh, and there are other forms of oppression. Uh, for example, um, having enough polling places or moving polling places that are in people of color communities uh, and cutting the number of polling places down. So that's a part of voter suppression. And uh, again, you know, that's coming from stripping section by half of the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act. Yeah, the 1965 Voting Rights Act made a lot of changes but just like with the 19th amendment um there was a lot of you you would see ways of going around that i feel like that's something that did happen well you know they, they tried to go around it but that was the reason you had uh certain states mostly southern states that would have to submit any changes that they would make to the apparatus of voting, okay? And when that was taken out uh, under Holger uh, case in Alabama, uh, about 2014, 2012, somewhere around that name, uh, then those states did not have to report to the Justice Department any changes that they were making. And so again, consequently, that's the reason you have voter suppression taking place today on the scale that it is taking place. Interesting. Um, someone was asking, let's see, to what extent did the form of protest and activism that was adopted by the women suffragists uh, during the, uh, before the 19th Amendment, uh, how did that impact the civil rights movement of the 40s, 50s, and 60s? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, I look at protests as a continuum. Uh, and, and, and I guess what I'm hearing in that question is that the women's protest provided a paradigm for the protest of the 60s. Uh, you know, help correct me if, if I'm mistaken that, but that's what I'm hearing. Uh, you can go back in Nashville, especially, and in other places of the, in the South, 
and look at the protests that took place prior to the 1920s. Uh, you know, or you know, the, the, the women's protest. Uh, when you look at the abolitionist movement, and you know, and some of those protests, so it operates along a continuum. Uh, another way to put that is that if I look at the abolitionist movement, which was a movement about freeing those who were enslaved, that comes in the 1830s. And then you have white women trying to do what? Gain the right of the franchise. So it works along the continuum. Uh, in almost, from my perspective, in almost every instance, when you see a movement for African Americans, or in this case, African Americans trying to gain access as proposed under the Constitution of, of the United States, you will find that a movement for women usually comes on the heels of that. Okay? Uh, and that goes all the way through, and you can take it up to the modern civil rights movement. Uh, and when you had the modern civil rights movement, what comes on the heels of the modern civil rights movement? The women's movement. Almost in every almost in every case when you look women are following what people of color have been doing in order to gain freedom equality and justice because if you look at the two groups they're all fighting for what? freedom equality and justice uh, so that's that's the way i see that yeah. Um, any thoughts on the forms of protest, like um, going about with uh, parades and banners and that stuff? I think that's something you didn't really see as often before uh, the women's suffrage movement. Um, yeah, and African Americans participated. I didn't go into it in in this short presentation, but for example, when women were protesting. Uh, during, you know, prior to the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson, for example, uh, you had black women who were participating in those march. Uh, there's a story about Ida B. Wells and her Al Alpha Suffrage Club, uh, and where white women from Chicago did not want her to be in with their group. They wanted her to come and her club to come at the end of their group. Now, you know, for those who may know anything about Ida B. Wells, uh, that was the antithesis of what she was going to do. Uh, so what she did is when the Chicago club passed, she and her group desegregates that, 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 that march. Uh, at the same time, you had Mary Church Terrell, who encouraged the uh, women of, of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated to participate in March in 1913. Uh, so, you know, women uh, were marching, African-American women were marching, uh, even if they had to fight to get into the march, uh, they were there. They, mm -hmm. Their presence was very much known and seen. And, you know, we don't, stop to take into consideration how dangerous that was for women. Uh, you know, when you read about them marching, uh, you, you read about some of the violence that may have been perpetrated upon women, and especially after Wilson decided, you know, it was no longer a joke for women to be out there marching, although he ultimately comes around and, you know, puts forth the 19th Amendment or backs the 19th Amendment. Uh, but, you know, he, he got a little perturbed at, at, at the women out there uh, launching. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do one final question, more of a, uh, you know, any um, thoughts on any readings, um, any books that you might recommend for people interested in this topic? Someone was asking about a biography on Sojourner Truth. Um, there are several books on Sojourner Truth. The one that I highly recommend uh, 
is the one by Nell Painter, uh, Sojourner Truth Assemble. Uh, there are several books. You can look at Elaine Weiss's book, The Women's Hour, um, which is a good rendition and, and inclusive uh, of why they marched, would be another one. Uh, Martha S. Jones is coming out with a book, I think later this year, called Women in the Vanguard. Uh, and there are, there's one book on, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, another book by Martha Jones is all bound up together. Uh, the Women Question in African American Public Culture from 1830 to 1900. Um, if, you, if you want a pioneering book on African American women and the suffrage movement, I strongly recommend Rosalind Turbo Penn's book, uh, African American Women. In the struggle for the vote, 1850 to 1920. She is, um, as a matter of fact, she just died, I think, the last part of last year. Uh, but she was in the forefront of bringing the African American women's story about suffrage to the forefront. Uh, so that is certainly one that I would recommend. Uh, and I mentioned why they marched, that was by uh, Susan Wayne. And it's untold stories of women who fought for the right to vote. Uh, if you want to get an idea about, I mentioned Frederick Douglass, I would certainly look at David Bright's book, uh, which is an autobiography of Douglass, uh, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Uh, and there is another book that basically focused on Tennessee women, and that was done by. Uh, Beverly Bond and Sarah Wilkerson Freeman, Tennessee Women, Their Lives and Times. I think it's a two volume work uh, that you might look at. And also, Fighting Chance, uh, which is really a book about the 15th Amendment, but it is titled The Struggle Over Women's Suffrage and Black Suffrage and Reconstruction in America. So, you know, and that's just a very, very, very short short list. Uh, those were some of the sources I used for this presentation. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a whole, there, there's a plethora of books out there on, on women's suffrage and new books are coming off the press every day, almost even as we speak about women's suffrage since this is the centennial year. Right, everyone wants to get their uh, feed for the, the topic staying topical. I had to write some down myself. But uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everyone who joined us. We had around 70 people in attendance for this. Um, I don't know if Rachel wants to come in and uh, close us off. Um, but uh, do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to switch off. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I lots of people, Dr. Ren, uh, or Professor Ren were saying how great the talk was. And I saw a couple of questions. One was, if we have a display about this, we do have um, a suffrage exhibit opening soon called Ratify. Um, keep checking back for the exact opening date that will contain quite a bit of this information. Um, and then I saw somebody else ask about getting a book list from you. Um, we don't have a written out book list, but we are recording this and it'll go up on our, our website. So if you go back, in a couple of days, but you can watch it again. You can pause it and write down all the books that she just cited. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, and she said she can send a, a list if we need to, but thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Linda. And thank you everybody who joined us today. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you uh, next month for more Lunch and Learns. Bye. Bye y'all, good afternoon. <laughs>